Bart? Oh my god, it does. <laughs> he is straight. Would you like to say hello to the other man?
and I see a lot of new faces, particularly maybe from DFO. The, the, the protocol here is that first we eat and drink, and then we do the talk. So all of you sitting in your seats, I'd invite you to get up and network. The, the, there's some snacks over there. Uh, there's a cash bar, and you can have a soft drink or a glass of wine or a beer. Um, and so we put as much importance in the networking as we do in the talk. Plus, I don't think Dr. Lee is here yet, so I'd invite you to kind of take a few. All right. <laughs> Santa is, is in sight. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we usually get underway in about uh, 20 after, 25 after. So take advantage of the time to network.
All right, if, um, if I could ask you to wrap up your conversations and uh, grab a seat, hopefully we've, I think we have about enough seats for everyone. There's more up at the front here if you need them. So, um, my name is Jim Hanlon. I'm the CEO here at Cove, the Center for Ocean Ventures and Entrepreneurship. For those of you who are visiting for the first time, welcome to Cove. Uh, for those who are uh, repeat offenders, welcome back. We're, we're always glad to see you here. Um, I want to sort of mention a few things before I introduce our uh, really interesting guest speaker for the, for the evening. First of all, a uh, couple of folks to thank, organizations to thank. Um, most people are aware that the facility called Cove is, um, is a building owned and operated by the province of Nova Scotia through an MOU that we have with them. Um, what you may not always be aware of is that the funding for the programs that we provide here, including my, my salary and our staff's salary, many of whom are here, um, is um, wonderfully provided by the Irving Shipyard. And so we, I want to do a shout out for them. And as a matter of fact, we've just put up a plaque right behind Darren there on the side of the wall by the entrance. And so d take a look at that. It sort of memorializes what I think has been an amazing contribution to the ocean economy here in, uh, in Halifax. So thank you to the Irving Shipbuilding folks. Also want to thank the sponsors for our Ocean Connector series. Um, two wonderful organizations, Cox and Palmer, uh, and I know Marlon is here somewhere. Marlon? So Marlon is um, the Ocean's Advisor to the Cox and Palmer Law Firm. Uh, I'd invite you if you are if you have legal needs uh, around Ocean's thing, they have some very deep expertise around that. And secondly, Killam Properties, and Killam Properties is actually our neighbor, so the buildings behind us are part of the Killam Reit uh, Properties. Um, we're, we're, we're developing a really interesting relationship with them around urban renewal. So what is happening here at Cove, in fact, benefits the neighborhood. So it's bringing a lot of young professionals and uh, and um, uh, vibration and, and positive vibe to the to the local community. So we've got a good working relationship with Killam. So Cox and Palmer and Killam are the sponsors for our Ocean Connector series. I believe we have a group of students again from NSCC from the Ocean Tech Program. Yeah, there we go. Thanks for coming back. We always like working with you folks. Um, I also want to do a little bit of a pat on the back to our organization. So a couple weeks ago, I was out in Seattle at the Oceans Conference um, where I was really, really honored to receive the, uh, the International Compass Award, uh, and it's for outstanding contributions to the science and technology of the ocean industry globally, so we're really, really proud of that. Again, if, uh, if I point to the pole where Darren is, around the back side is the plaque that I was uh, really happy to bring home from Seattle. So take a look at that if you get a chance. Um, that's all I'm going to say about the, the intros. I've got the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker. And um, often I end up with um, a bio on our speaker that's, that's uh, very academic and detailed and long-winded. This one isn't. And so rather than trying to extract factoids, I'm actually going to read it because I think it's a really cool narrative. So first of all, Ken attended Queen Elizabeth High School. Um, nobody knows what that is if you're young because it's not there anymore. <laughs> but I know what it is. <laughs> so so a, a proud Halifax boy. So uh, grew up in Halifax. Graduated from Dalhousie University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Marine Biology. He then obtained a Master of Science and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Limnology. Who knows what Limnology is? I know what that is. Okay, so oceans is, oceanography is oceans. Limnology is inland waters, lakes and rivers and all that good stuff. So um, he actually did freshwater for his uh, graduate studies. Um, um, he then uh, decided that biologists like himself needed to uh, understand more about chemistry, and so he accepted a postdoc fellowship in ocean chemistry, so broadening his perspective in that regard. In the late 80s, that led him to research at uh, IOS, the Institute of Ocean Sciences, so the Bedford Institute of the West Coast out in uh, Sydney, BC, a beautiful location, with the Department of Fisheries Oceans on the potential use and effects of chemical oil dispersants, which is what we're going to hear a lot more about tonight. In 1984, uh, Ken returned home to Halifax, where he worked on projects to assess the potential environmental impacts related to the expansion of the offshore oil and gas industry, including the oil spills. Five years later, he accepted a position as research scientist with the DFO at the Maurice Lamontagne Institute in Rimouski, Quebec, also a really cool place, where he established a research group to study microbial transformations of contaminants in estuarine and coastal environments. In 2001, he again returned to Halifax. He kept coming back to Halifax. There's something notable about that. Everybody from Halifax always comes back to Halifax, where he became the founding director of the Center for Ocean for Offshore Oil, Gas, and Energy Research, or Cougar at BIO. That center conducted studies to support the development 
and revision of regulatory guidelines for Canada's offshore oil industry. In addition, he's also worked on other environmental issues within Atlantic Canada, such as contaminants in Sydney Harbour, the Sydney tar ponds, and monitoring the lingering effects of the oil spill from the tanker error that spilled 10,000 tons of Bunker Sea oil into Nova Scotia's Shadow Bay in 1970. Since that, and off the end of this page, I know you've spent um, more recent times um, with CSIRO in Australia, and now back home yet again to Halifax, where he continues to do world-leading research in uh, oil spill uh, mitigation. And so without further ado, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Ken Lee. Thanks. I was, I was asked to uh, give a talk at this meeting and on what I'm doing now and the importance of the work and how it relates to industry. So this is really not a scientific talk. You can ask me any questions about any project and we can talk about the science later. It's really where I think science should be going and where we need um, developments from the private sector to support research needs. So what I want to talk about is really um, making decisions for oil spills and the science we need for that and the advances in technologies. So when we're talking about Canada and oil spills, um, one of the things we have to realize when we think about oil spills, everybody thinks about tankers. And if you look at the data on the left-hand side in the bottom there, it's looking at tanker spills um, over the last few decades. And you can see that they've dramatically dropped. Um, this is information from uh, the International Oil Tanker Association in the UK. Um, Essentially, with double hull tankers and the, and the loss of those old Russian tankers and everything else, um, and increases in safety precautions, the number of tanker spills has dramatically dropped. However, the risk of accidental oil spills in Canada is still expected to be a major concern. And this is because of increases in marine shipping traffic, including the Canadian Arctic, anticipated increases in exploration and production of the offshore oil and gas sector potentially. And then of course, as we've all seen on the news recently in the last few years, pipeline and rail transport spills of crude oil and refined fuels. In the Arctic, the concern now isn't oil spills of crude oil from offshore oil and gas. The, the concern about oil spills in the Arctic is really um, the increase in traffic in the Arctic. So between 1990 and 2015, the distance traveled by ships in the Arctic has approximately tripled in Canada. And of course, northern communities are growing, industries are growing in the Arctic, such as mining sectors, and therefore there's large increases in the amount of fuel being shipped across the Arctic to these um, communities and industrial sites. Um, we also have things in the Arctic, as we all know now, um, ecotourism is increasing. So now we're looking at large ships going across the Arctic in the future. And of course, one of the concerns is an accident in one of these ships. In terms of oil spill research in Canada, um, the Government of Canada has been conducting research on oil spills for decades. And in fact, here in Nova Scotia, following the spill of the arrow off Shadowbacto Bay in the 1970s, um, we've been conducting research on that site and never have stopped since then. Um, at BIO, ongoing research has been going on on oil spills since the arrow spill. Arrow actually started a lot of oil spill research in Atlantic Canada. We're currently conducting studies on the fate, behavior, and effects of oil spills. For instance, the Cougar Lab at BIO, um, including refined products. So not only looking at crude oils, but refined products. And myself and, and a number of others, we've been working on spill remediation strategies, how to clean up oil spills, to provide data for emergency response and, and operations and technologies. And of course, one of the major things we have to do is address the public's concern over oil spills and protect the marine environment. When oil spills occur, it's always the fisheries that come up first saying, what's happening to our fisheries in the future? What's the impact? And we have to answer those questions. Many of you probably know about Canada's Oceans Protection Plan. Um, this was a plan announced by our Prime Minister a few years ago. It's a $1.5 billion program 
a five-year program and it has a number of pillars, improve marine safety and responsible shipping, protect Canada's marine environment, strengthen partnerships with indigenous communities, and to me, one of the most important things, invest in science for evidence-based decision making. One of the initiatives under Canada's Oceans Protection Plan, and it's only one of 50 or so, and there are a number of initiatives looking at oil spills besides the one I'm going to talk about today that I lead, which is a multi-partner research initiative. Um, for instance, the Cougar Lab receives money under OPP, so does Environment Canada, Transport Canada, all the federal departments actually have research programs on oil spills. The multi-partner research initiative is a little bit different. Um, it had a goal to establish an integrated global research network to advance oil spill research in Canada and to enhance Canada's level of preparedness and response capability. So this was really an applied research program. And the focus of MPRI is to advance scientific knowledge to address major gaps in oil spill response and remediation strategies and to support the development of alternative response measures. And I'll talk about that. Um, this is something that the Government of Canada is trying to move forward for the protection of the marine environment in the event of oil spills. The priorities of the MPRI program were really set up from top-down fashion um, based on recommendations from the Royal Society of Canada report in 2015 that I had the honour of chairing. Um, this was a report on the behavior and environmental effects of crude oil released into aqueous environments. And in addition to this report, we also took the recommendation of Transport Canada's Tinker Safety Expert Panel report. Now, for those of you that are in research or supporting research, the Royal Society of Canada report identified over 400 recommendations for oil spill research. And these were honed down into seven categories or areas that we thought were important to address. One was the environmental impacts of oil spills in high risk, poorly understood areas like the Arctic, for example. Effects of spills on aquatic life and wildlife, but at the population, community, and ecosystem levels. So we're looking at whole, assist, whole of ecosystem changes rather than focusing on single species. Determining environmental and ecological characteristics of areas that may be affected by future oil spills and to identify any unique sensitivity um, to oil effects. The other area that I've, I've been pushing for a number of years, for those who know me, is the opportunity to conduct controlled field trials and spills of opportunity so we can have long-term monitoring programs and understand the fate and behavior effects of crude oils in different ecosystems and conditions. It's a consensus of the scientific community that we really can't develop new technologies for oil spills unless we can tech them, uh, test them on a realistic scale, on an operational scale. It's one thing to develop technologies in the lab or in a test tank. It's another thing in the open environment. We want to understand the effectiveness of various oil spill response techniques and how do we do that. Um, improve prevention and de decision support systems um, to guide us in oil spill response. And updating and refining the risk and impact assessment protocols for oil spills in Canada. Um, the risk assessment was primarily focused on uh, one area that we pointed out was pipelines. Um, the operators of the pipelines always say that, well, should a pipeline spill occur, we can tell you exactly what the worst case will be. Um, once the pressure drops, the volume of oil releases what's in the pipeline. Unfortunately, sometimes it took them days or weeks before they realized the pipeline was leaking when we actually looked at real case scenarios. The other area in the multi-partner research initiative that I really pushed was the training of the next generation of scientists. Um, if you look at oil spill research right now in Canada, most of it's done by the federal government, by Environment Canada or Environment Climate Change Canada as it's now called, and Fisheries and Oceans. We want to increase research in the academic sector. And as I mentioned, in terms of the next generation, we have to replace those gray hairs or no hairs like myself. 
The other thing is, when we're talking about oil spills, it's not a national issue, it's an international issue. And we really should be working with the best in the world if we want to have a world-class regime. So one of the things that we wanted to do with MPRI was to actually bring in and foster interactions with key institutes or institutions that conduct oil spill research on a global scale. And then, of course, there's the importance of engagement. And in the governance system of the MPRI research program, um, we involve key clients and stakeholders. We have representatives from the federal government, um, all the provinces and territories, indigenous groups, oil and gas industry regulators, um, the operational oil spill response organizations, academia, fisheries groups, NGOs, and as I mentioned, other international research organizations. The MPRI program had a 40 million budget given to it for over four years, and to date we've funded 36 projects. So when we're looking at oil spill response options, um, one of the things we have to realize is there's no single technique that's 100% effective. And the goal is to design a response strategy based on um, net environmental benefit analysis, which I'll explain. And when we were looking at oil spill response, there's really a number of things we can do. We can look at mechanical recovery, um, putting the oil back in the bottle, as I say, um, chemical dispersion, in situ burning, and monitoring and evaluating the spill and looking at natural recovery. I'll mention um, right now in open sea conditions, right now there's a, a great attraction on using chemical dispersants um, due to restrictions of the other methods, and I'll explain why. One of the reasons why we need research and, and technology to monitor oil spills is the fact that when we're responding to oil spills, we have to make decisions. And these decisions are based on a number of trade-offs. Every technology has advantages and disadvantages. How do we decide what we're going to use? And it's based on science and data. And therefore, we have a NEBA process, a net environmental benefit analysis, where we evaluate the trade-offs between the various options we have that will result in the reduction of potential adverse effects and the best overall recovery. So it's always a trade-off situation. So this bottom graph just shows you, um, to do NEBA, we have to understand the effectiveness of the tools, the feasibility, can we even use these tools, put it into a framework that we can get together an analysis and also look at regulations, whether you can use them or not. For the analysis to make decisions on what we're going to do with oil spills, we need a lot of information and data. So we need field monitoring programs, geospatial data, characterization of this oil that's spilled, predictive models and where the oil is going, if we treat it or not, and if, if with different treatments, what's the different result, understanding ambient conditions, what are the response tactics and other information. Right now in Canada, for oil spills at sea, believe it or not, we only have one response technology that we're legally allowed to use, and that's at sea mechanical recovery. And essentially, this is booming and skimming, physically recovering the oil by towing a boom behind a ship and then using a skimmer to recover that oil. It has a number of limitations. It's limited by weather, sea state conditions. Um, you can't tow a boom at more than, say, two knots. Um, because of the maintaining the integrity of the boom against all the stresses, you can only do it in daylight operations. You require storage capability to bring that oil back to shore, and you can create large volumes of oily waste because not only are you recovering oil, we're already also recovering emulsified oil, in some cases, water contaminated by oil. And believe it or not, um, typically in the open water conditions, at open sea conditions, only about 10% recovery is achieved. 
And the reason for this is quite simple. This is a photo of the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, and there you see a slick around the, the, the operations, and you see a ship going through that slick. If that ship was towing a boom, it would maybe make two passes through that slick in a day. You can cover that whole slick in a day with an ads pack on an aircraft applying oil dispersants. You can only recover the oil you can encounter. So everybody's got these great ideas, but it really comes down to something quite simple. In the MPRI program, as I mentioned, the Royal Society of Canada identified 400 areas for research. But well, we can't cover them all, so that we need to focus. And so what we said was, let's focus on alternative response measures. These are techniques that the Canadian government, um, Transport Canada, Environment Canada, want to use to improve our toolbox for oil spill response. But due to a number of reasons, um, we don't have enough scientific information to make the decisions or feel comfortable, or due to regulatory hurdles. For instance, under the Fisheries Act, we can't put deleterious substances in the marine environment. So we're looking at technologies like spill treating agents, burning oil at sea, in situ burning, oil translocation, essentially looking at the uh, release of oil from shorelines with oil particle interactions or other techniques, decanting oil and oily waste. Right now, if we collect oil at sea um, from booming and skimming, it has water in it. We can't decant the water and put it back into the ocean. The other thing is we can never clean up an oil spill 100%. So let's look at natural recovery. What can natural recovery achieve? So we look at natural attenuation, and if bacteria are breaking down the oil, can we enhance those degradation rates? And then, of course, every scientist is going to say, but you left out the other 390-some techniques or priorities, and so I put them all under something called cross-cutting expertise so we can cover those off too. So spill treating agents are any products that can change the behavior of spilled oil in the environment to facilitate cleanup. And so we have a number of research programs, MPRI, to understand the effectiveness and potential environmental impacts of these spill treating agents, um, such as chemical oil dispersants. So we're looking at things like toxicity, the sinking of oil due to the interaction with suspended particles, and trying to understand how well these techniques work in the Canadian environment. So if in key words for some of the projects, um, dispersant effectiveness, understanding subsurface blowouts, plume behavior, photo oxidation, oil droplets, oil particle interactions, surface transport, where's the oil going, shoreline cleaning agents, these are chemicals that are applied to shorelines, bio-based agents, these are chemical oil dispersants derived from uh, microbes, and oil spill reconnaissance. If you're gonna treat an oil spill, you have to know where it is and how much oil there is. One of the things when we talk about chemical oil dispersants, I'll just use this as an example of arms because it's so popular in discussion right now. It's actually based on the concept of transferring the oil from the sea surface into the water column. So everybody thinks, oh, you're just sweeping the oil under the rug. But really, you're not. What you want to do is dilute that oil as small droplets to concentrations that are so low, we don't have toxic effects. And then the other thing is, when you disperse oil into small droplets, you increase the surface area of the oil, and bacteria can only attack oil at the oil-water interface, so therefore the degradation rates of the oil is actually increased in the environment when you chemically disperse them. I'll just quickly go through this. Um, surface oil dispersant applications I mentioned, you can um, treat large volumes of oil, um, you can use aircraft. One of the things is you can reduce uh, vapors on the water, water surface for worker safety. You don't need the storage capacity to recover oil and bring it back to shore. However, there's a number of limitations for chemical oil dispersants. You need regulatory approvals, which we're still trying to get. Um, right now, the offshore industry can use them, but we're trying to get them for ship source spills. They don't work in calm seas. You need some mixing energy. You just can't apply dispersants. And then, of course, the public is concerned about things like toxicity. And there's also a short window of opportunity. As the oil is released in the environment and it starts weathering, things like evaporation occur, the oil becomes so viscous that you can't disperse them. 
In the Gulf of Mexico operation, for the first time, and I was directly involved in this program, was applying chemical oil dispersants by subsurface injection. Where we actually just injected the dispersants into the plume at 1,500 meters depth. And the reason for that was to reduce the VOCs on the surface so people could actually work around the spill site. The other thing was, as the oil was rising through 1,500 meters of water, it was emulsifying, so by adding dispersants, you could reduce emulsification. And then, of course, if you know you're applying the oil and the dispersants together in contact with each other right away, you're reducing the amount of dispersant that could be used. It had a number of benefits, as you can see in this slide. Um, the major benefit was um, the effectiveness of trying to disperse the oil um, and making contact with the oil. And there was evidence now um, that's been validated by National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. that they did reduce surface VOCs. There's obviously limitations, and we're still looking at all the limitations and understanding the pros and cons of all the techniques that we talk about in arms. This is a surprising figure in the Gulf of Mexico um, oil spill operations. It's the fate of oil spill um, and effectiveness of the various cleanup technologies that was put out by NOAA in what they call the oil budget calculator. And of course, scientists can never agree to anything when you get enough scientists together. So we came up with the best case, expected case, and worst case, and I served on this committee. But to a lot of people, I think under almost ideal conditions in the Gulf of Mexico, they only physically recovered. All those pictures you see of, I think it was 400 ships pulling boom around, they recovered somewhere between 4% and 2% of the oil in physical recovery. Some days they burn as much oil as released, but burning is also dependent on the use of a boom. You can't ignite oil unless it's thick enough, so you have to drag a boom to get the oil thick enough before you can burn it. So therefore they only burn between 5 and 6%. The consensus was that chemical dispersants probably accounted for 10 to 29 percent of the cleanup of oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, there's a, a lot of evaporation and, and dissolution that occurred naturally, natural dispersion, and then of course once they got the line on it, you know exactly how much they recovered. So that was about 17 percent. So that gives you an idea why we're looking at alternative response technologies and the need for science. One of the big questions in the Gulf of Mexico was toxicity of the chemical dispersants. Um, recently, I served on the U.S. National Academy of Sciences um, report on oil dispersant use, and the consensus was um, review of existing laboratory-based dispersant-only toxicity data showed that when compared to field conditions, dispersant concentrations were allowed below toxicity threshold limits in the field. So they were dispersed to those very low concentrations. The toxicity isn't the dispersant, the toxicity is the dispersed oil. Um, dispersants make the oil um, more bioavailable. In situ burning, burning oil at sea, um, this was a technology that was really highlighted by research in Environment Canada many years ago, but it wasn't tested in the field on a large scale until the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Um, you, can, you can burn a lot of oil very quickly if you can ignite it at sea. And right now we have a number of research programs under the MPRI program to look at burning oil at sea um, by actually bo booming it, making improvements on the boom and other technologies to ignite the oil. The other thing that we're looking at is the use of herding agents. Rather than using a boom, can we use chemical surfactants or herding agents that actually chemically push the oil into a smaller volume area on the surface so you can get the oil thick enough to ignite? So we're looking at these herding technologies right now. The idea right now is that if you can apply herders very quickly and we can get herders out to a spill, say by aircraft, and apply them effectively, we can actually burn large volumes of oil at sea. Oil translocation is another one of the arms. It's the movement of oil from one compartment to another where it can be covered more easily. Um, 
by, by techniques such as booming and skimming and looking at the formation of oil particle interactions that will actually naturally disperse oil and, and enhance microbial degradation. We want to understand this process so we can make strategic decisions when to use it or not to use um, these technologies. Right now we're in the process of building a mesocosm facility on the west coast of BC so we can do large scale tests on oil translocation. Decanting of oil at sea, as I mentioned, um, when you recover oil at sea using the techniques we're using now, physical recovery, booming and skimming, how can we separate that oil from the water? What's acceptable to put back into the ocean? We're doing that basic science so we can make decisions for regulations and policies to allow the use of decanting legally within Canada. The other thing is we're looking at other cleanup technologies such as absorbents and things like that and there are a number of research programs to improve waste treatment. People don't realize that you know you can collect one ton of oil, you can also come, come along with it as 10 ton, tons of oily waste and what do we do with that? So there's a number of engineering studies right now um, conducted, for instance, at Dalhousie University, as many of you know, Memorial University in Newfoundland, University of Northern British Columbia, CSRO in Australia, where we're looking at various technologies as well as the University of Toronto. Natural attenuation. As I mentioned, you can never clean up an oil spill 100%. And in some cases, you can't do anything. For instance, just this year, um, we've had a number of spills off Hibernia, and I got a call saying, look, we've had this oil spill off the coast of Newfoundland. Um, what do we do? And my response to Coast Guard was, what's the conditions? And they said, well, we've had a storm in seven or eight meter waves. My reply was, I'm going back to bed because there's physically, there's nothing you can do. And so what happened to those oil spills in, off the coast of Newfoundland? The public and World War, uh, Canadian uh, WWF, World Wildlife Foundation, jump up and down, Sierras jumping up and down. There's really not much you can do. Essentially, that oil was naturally dispersed and biodegraded. So we need a better understanding of what's the capacity for the environment to degrade oil. Oil is not new to the environment. There are natural oil seeps that occur around the world, and I tell people it wasn't for natural seepage. Um, for, nat for nat natural microbes degrading the oil from these seepages, we'd be knee deep in oil. So bacteria have adapted to degrading oil in the environment. It's just that when you have a tanker spill, there's so much oil they just can't keep up, it takes time. But it does occur and that's what happened to a lot of the oil. Um, if you, if you look at Nova Scotia from the aero spill, in fact, the consensus right now is, the big question is what happened to most of the oil in the Gulf of Mexico? It's been degraded by microbes. In fact, you couldn't pick a better oil to degrade in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a, a light oil, highly biodegradable. So we're conducting a number of studies now in Canada to understand the capacity to de for bacteria in the environment to degrade oil. We're actually conducting studies right now on the Pacific Ocean, right across the Northwest Passage and the Atlantic Ocean. And this is a lot of genomics work. We're even doing eDNA work. It's a lot of coupled studies right now. It includes um, organizations like CSRO in Australia, um, researchers from McGill University, the National Research Council, um, some researchers from Sintef in Norway, as well as uh, some, some universities in Denmark. So we're having a much better understanding of what's the capacity of microbes in the environment to degrade oil. And in fact, we're even looking at oil degradation encapsulated in ice in the Canadian Arctic, and it does occur. And for all of you here, you know, trying to understand um, how do you fit in? What can you do? Well, to make decisions on using these technologies, we need a range of science. And this is where I said all those recommendations in the, National, in the Royal Society of Canada report can fit in what I call cross-cutting science activities. Any one of those technologies, we need to know what's the chemistry of the oil, how much oil, where is the oil, before we even decide which technique we're going to use to clean up. 
So we need data and instrumentation to understand chemical composition and properties of the oil spill. And this includes both crude oils, unconventional crude oils, such as diluted bitumen, obviously, in Canada, and refined fuels. In the case of refined fuels, for those of you who don't know, the IMO is promoting the use of um, low sulfur emission of oils, fuel oils in the Canadian Arctic in the future in 2020. And right now, we don't know what happens in the environment when these low sulfur fuel oil um, formulations um, would be spilled in the environment. The problem I have is I can't get any of these oils to study right now because until the, the, the rules come in, there's no demand to buy them and industry isn't exactly producing them. So it's, it's, they can make them, but it's hard to get them for research. Oil detection, physical characterization, identification. We need studies in oil forensics, remote sensing, in situ monitoring. We have a large research program on AUVs right now, um, led by Neil Bose in Newfoundland, who many of you probably know. This is a collaborative study that includes um, MUN with their Explorer class submersibles, Dalhousie University, Ali is here um, with, with um, Neopar, um, includes people from Woods Hole Oceanographic and NOAA in the US. Looking at submerged oil detection, not only with AUVs, we have to understand if we have an oil spill under ice from a subsurface blowout, where's that oil moving under ice, for instance? The other thing is if you're going to treat oil spills, you have a big slick, what slick do you treat? So we want to understand oil thickness. How do we measure oil thickness? Obviously, we need better techniques for mapping and shoreline mapping techniques for where the oil is to clean up. Oil fate behavior and transport, oil weathers, its properties are changing, its physical properties are changing after it's released. That can influence what technique you choose to clean up oil spills. So we need rapid techniques to identify oil properties. Understanding the interaction between oil and fine mineral particles or suspended particles in the water column. That's something that hasn't been looked in the past, hasn't been well quantified, and we feel that's a lost um, pathway that hasn't been really accounted for. Oil trajectory modeling on both surface and deep water. Since the Gulf of Mexico, there's a large increase in what happens when you have oil released in a subsurface blowout, where it's not only oil being released, it's oil and gas, and you're developing all these small particles. And then, of course, mass balance. Where's the oil going? How do we calculate mass balance? Microbial genomics, trying to understand what organisms are there, what are they doing? And then, of course, all of these techniques, the public always wants to know well, what's going on with the organisms, what's the toxicity of the oil, or the toxicity of the oil plus whatever you're treating it with. So under the MPRI program, we're trying to standardize techniques for toxicity now. Um, I mentioned earlier, somebody here in the audience, we're developing QA, QC protocols so we can standardize um, chemical measurements as well as toxicity measurements. One of the things that we have to understand is much better baseline. So it's not only doing work when a spill occurs, you always want to know what was the environment before an oil spill occurs. It doesn't matter what spill occurs, whether it's Exxon Valdez or the aero spill, we don't know what was there before it occurred. So how do you look at recovery if you don't have a good baseline? And then of course, data management. And to me, data management and modeling really brings everything together so we can look at the big picture. And we're trying to take that into account now. Um, we need that data for net benefit analysis. And the other thing that's important now is to understand the impact of oil spills on ecosystem services. The ecosystem provides a number of services that benefit us, such as you know drinking water and everything else, archaeological sites that we want to protect. Um, what's the impact of oil spills on these factors that are important to the population as a whole? So in conclusion, the MPRI science outcomes and impacts and what we're trying to do with oil spill research and where we need the support of people like yourself is 
we, we need support to make decisions on how we're going to respond to oil spills. We want everybody to try and work together. One of the things that we found in the Royal Society of Canada report is when spills occur, we're scrambling to get information to make decisions. People aren't working together. Some of the data is in federal government, provincial government, industry, and academia. And we have to make a decision in minutes and hours. So how do we get people to work together and try and foster those interactions? That's what I'm trying to do with the MPRI program. So what are we looking at for outcomes and impacts? Improve Canada's oil spill preparedness and response regime by enhancement of science-based decision making. We need the science, we need the technologies. Greater public confidence in the government's ability to respond to and remediate oil spills. Every time a spill occurs, the public always says, well, here we go again, we don't know nothing, and we have another disaster on our hands. We've been doing research for years, we just keep moving that mark forward, and when we can do it together. Development and commercialization and application of oil spill response strategies. That's something we should be looking at. The other thing we're trying to do with MPRI, with the funds we have, is how do we leverage research, reduce duplication of effort between industry, academia, and government agencies. The MPRI research funds, all 40 million, cannot be used by Government of Canada agencies. It's to foster interactions between academia and industry. However, in each one of these interactions, we expect the program to be levers. So you're putting up somewhere between 25 and 50%. And then of course, overall, what we want to do is enhance uh, research capability and quality of advice and coordination in the Government of Canada by getting people to work together. And to me, the most important thing of all is the education of highly qualified personnel for the future in oil spill research. Right now, under this program, I think we're supporting between 70 and 80 um, graduate students and postdocs in Canada. And that, I hope, will make a huge change in the future in Canada's oil spill response capability. I'll be glad to take any questions. If you have any technical questions on specific projects, I'll be glad to answer them. Questions, I'd be glad to get the mic to you. If, if, if not, I'll start it off. Can, can a question about the, um, the controlled field experiment that you alluded to, what countries are doing what in that regard and what might that look like in, in the Canadian context? Well, right now I'm trying to uh, get permits to spill oil in the environment. Many years ago, Canada was a leader in oil spill research, and the reason why was we actually had the capacity to go out in the environment and spill oil to do research. Um, the countries that are now leading oil spill research in the world, are Norway is number one, and one of the reasons is because they have the capacity to conduct oil spills off the coast of Norway. Um, changes in legislation in Canada uh, now allow on paper um, for us to ask for permitting to conduct studies at sea to release oil and I'm in the process now of trying to go through that to test the system, I guess, to see if we can spill oil legally um, to conduct experiments. So we're, we're doing that as we speak. Um, there's a number of studies I'm looking at, um, potentially um, studies to look at in situ burning um, with booming and skimming. Believe it or not, the oil spill response organizations say in the Bay of Fundy Alert, which is one of the accredited companies, they say, look, we own all the equipment to do it, but legally we can't use it. And so we're trying to say, let's go out and use it, demonstrate it, train people how to use it. And so we're trying to do that. Um, herders, we're looking at an offshore study with herders. Exxon Mobil right now is developing um, a SIDU. You know, one of those crafts that you, you ride on that they feel they can drop all of an aircraft in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to run around slicks to apply herders to bring them into a smaller area so they can ignite them. So these are, you know, these are large collaborative multi-million dollar studies. Is there someone on the sea when it comes out of the airplane or is it? No. Sorry? Is there someone on the sea when it comes out of the airplane? No. no, no. I'm trying to get their director to do a, a full <laughs> little sitting on one like uh, I think it was Dr. Strangelove with the cowboy hat. <laughs> 
Carlin. I can, yes. Uh, you know, the best oil spill is the one that doesn't happen. And I'm, That's correct. And, I, and I'm wondering, to what extent does the research that you're doing feed back into the regulatory, legal, technical aspects of trying to put in place preventative measures so that you don't have to be faced with trying to deal with a large, unexpected uh, disaster at sea? Right. So preparedness is, is definitely one of the things in um, what the government of Canada is trying to do under the Oceans Protection Plan. So there are huge programs in Coast Guard that are focused on preparedness, just what you're talking about, rather than the MPRI program. The MPRI program is focused on alternative response measures and how do we um, produce or have the science that we need so we can put together policies and regulations to legally use these cleanup techniques. Coast Guard and Transport Canada are doing the preparedness side with funds within their department. For instance, Coast Guard is putting in depots all across the Arctic. Um, Transport Canada is doing all kinds of work in hydrography to make safer shipping so the occurrence of accidents are reduced. So it's just a larger program, or even much larger, in fact, on the preparedness side. I'm just wondering if if the research on herders is going forward and you you can successfully deploy a boom and then a herder to collect the oil. Um, throughout your talk, you mentioned that the goal would then be to ignite it. But if you can do all that, um, in situ burning is still transferring carbon into another part of the ecosystem, the air. If you can do all that, if you can locate the oil and herd it together so you could burn it, why not use the herders in order to collect it mechanically so you can burn it on, on shore in a, more, in a more controlled environment so the carbon isn't going into the environment? Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, burning oil at sea is not an effective burn. But I hate to say it, one thing you have to remember is if we didn't spill the oil, it would still get burned. Yes. Thanks, Ken. If there were private funding, if there was private sector funding, would uh, the MPRI support R&D on better mechanical recovery? In terms of mechanical recovery, um, under MPRI, we're not funding any work on mechanical recovery because the Canadian Coast Guard considers it uh, an established technology that they are already in place and can use legally. So the focus was on improving the toolbox, looking at these arms, which doesn't include mechanical recovery. But when you look at what we're doing on decanting and, and waste treatment, that supports the booming and skimming mechanical recovery. You know, what do we do with the oil, emulsified oil, and water that we result from mechanical recovery. And, and coming back to the question on in-situ burning, the, the main reason for in-situ burning is because of the fact that you don't have to bring oil back to shore. Um, one of the problems is when you have a spill and you're moving things back by shore, your bottleneck is getting those ships and tankers to bring that oil to recover at sea back to shore. So they're trying to make it more efficient by treating the oil at sea. Thank you. I have another question. I know your particular area of expertise includes um, control of oil and dispersants in, in cold water and in ice-infested water. Could you comment a little bit about the particular challenges around that? Well, I mean, in, in terms of cold water, um, dispersants do work in cold water, and, and there are formulations that are developed specifically for the Arctic, for instance, that are under development right now, and in fact, about to go to market. So ExxonMobil, for instance, has produced a, a gelled formulation of an oil dispersant that they've made just for cold water. It, it actually is less toxic and more concentrated because it's a gel form. So dispersants do work in cold water. One of the things that you're looking at, say, in the Gulf of Mexico, where they did subsurface injection of dispersants, you have to remember, at 1,500 meters deep, that water was not warm, even though it was in the Gulf of Mexico. Ken, what are our distinguished colleagues in Russia doing, and are they preparing in the same way that we are in doing the research up in the Arctic surrounding the spills that are undoubtedly going to be coming out of their side? Uh, that's a really good question. I really can't comment too much on what the Russians are doing. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm yeah. in the U.S. Congress right now. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually gave a talk to the... Uh, the 
Academy of Sciences in Russia on oil spills, and, and I was a little shocked because a lot of the people in the audience, there weren't any young people, so I thought, well, gee, you know, are they all out in the field? So I actually asked somebody, I said, you know, where are all the young scientists? And what I was told was we don't have any anymore. So it's, it's kind of a sad situation in Russia. That's true for all of us. That would only be fake news. Um, it's often said that there's a, there's a truism about robotics that robots are appropriate when the situation is dull, dirty, or dangerous. Do you see a role for robotics in all this? Um, Definitely. I mean, you know, if you look at the role of robotics and you look at the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, they would have never capped that uh, spill down there if it wasn't for robotics. And if it wasn't for industry and their capability in robotics, not the government, you know, the U.S. government didn't have that capability, they would have had a hard time. So, um, no, I think robotics is definitely a, um, a situation that we need for looking at things like subsurface blowouts where you have to do work in extreme conditions. So, by all means, robotics. Is, is something that's important. Not only that, for collection of samples and things like that, where we're going and collecting, say for instance right now, where we're collecting samples of corals and things like that, a lot of it's AUVs and robotics, or ROVs and robotics. Yes? We actually have the dispersant approved, one dispersant approved for use in Canada right now, it's uh, Corexit. So there is a approved dispersant formulation and the offshore petroleum boards can use dispersants for spills from the platforms. But uh, in Canada right now, chemical oil dispersants, as far as I know, there's only one dispersant formulation approved. Um, if you go to something like France or other countries around the world, there are a number of products that are approved. Unfortunately, Environment Canada is only approved one for use in Canada, and that's the one that was used in the Gulf of Mexico. We're, we're testing a, a number of dispersants under the MPRI program that are used around the world. In fact, I was recently in Southampton in England at the world stockpile of dispersants, so I've seen all of the dispersants that are available, and, and I have them all on hand for research um, within our research program right now. And as I mentioned, we're also developing bile dispersants. These are from natural bacteria that have been isolated off Newfoundland um, that naturally disperse oil and trying to make a dispersant formulation based on products of living organisms. Yes? Can you mention there is a certain type of dispersant that's approved right now for use? Is that only for a small scale cleanup off the platform? Or say we have a large scale still like in development, do we have the approval to spray it on aircraft on a large scale? Right now, no, we don't have legal legislation to apply dispersant. It was, it wasn't a platform, and the petroleum board gave the regulation and go ahead. The petroleum boards can can authorize use of dispersants for the platforms. But say if we had a large ship sink, um, we can't legally apply those dispersants right now um, because under the Fisheries Act, you can't put deleterious substances in the marine environment. So that's why we're doing this research, so we can actually change regulations for arms. Uh, they they have a, a not, well I wouldn't call it an exemption, but they have a way of asking for permission to use it. And of course, like the Gulf of Mexico, um, when you have a big disaster like that, um, you would be surprised how fast decisions are made. So I actually worked on the oil spill response operations in the Gulf of Mexico. So when needed, you know, exemptions are made. You know, they pulled out all stops down there because the spill was so large. And that's why we went to use subsurface oil dispersants. It was never used before. It was a decision made very quickly, tested, brought before a scientific panel and approved. Yeah, Ken, I have, yes. yeah, um, in field tests or studies, would there be would there be any value to looking at um, you know like known sites, World War II sinkings or Suez, can it, like Panama, places where vessels have been sunk in combat and and, and spilled? Would they give you like a timeline of aging, and, or is that too old? Too old? You need something fresh and follow the whole. No, I, th I think the thing you have to realize. 
realize is if we're looking at field trials, we're looking at controlled oil releases so we can collect scientific information. So one of the advantages of field trials is we can control the conditions, when, where, how are we going to release the oil um, to make sure, you know, to go and look at a natural seep from a ship that some years ago would be very difficult. Yeah, so there's no such thing as a spill of opportunity. In yes, there are science. spills of opportunity. Yeah. One of the things I'm looking at is should an accident occur, um, should we be tracking those spills of opportunity and collecting data and look at long-term effects of that spill? The Arrow is a classic example of a spill of opportunity. Um, back when the Arrow um, spilled oil, there was one cove that they decided not to do anything with called Black Duck Cove. And so for the past 40 years now almost, we've gone back and sampled that site. And I would say it's the best site in the world to show data on what can happen in natural recovery. I can't resist. Did they name it before or after the spill? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, uh, thank you for your questions. I always assess the uh, the, um, the value of these talks by the engagement with the audience, and this has been great. So, Ken, um, it's it's. Um, I often tell people you sometimes underappreciate the level of world class expertise that we're lucky to have in this town, and you're certainly an example of that. So we really appreciate your taking time to speak with us tonight. Um, please continue the networking. If you can stay for a few minutes longer, you may find some one on one conversations to be had. And uh, thank you for your attention. And on behalf of and uh, the audience, we'd like to present you with a, a little thank you gift. And uh, thanks very much for joining us tonight, Ken. Thank you. Cheers. Please feel free to uh, resume your eating and snacking and 